So I'll go live and it's loading. Okay. Okay, we're live. So we can start. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, we have a great presenter today, Ms. Kim Eggers, and I will turn it over to her. Hi, thank you for joining us today. This presentation is on wills in the time of COVID. It's a talk on end of life documents and social distancing. Um, having trouble going to the next, there we go. So today I will be talking about the common end of life planning documents, the execution or signing requirements for these documents and changes to execution requirements due to COVID-19. My name is Kim Eggers and I'm a native of North Carolina. I attended Appalachian State and then Campbell School of Law. I've practiced law for over 20 years and I'm currently a staff attorney at the Senior Law Project, which is a division of legal aid serving clients ages 60 and over. And I work in the Boone office. So some caveats to this presentation are that I can only give general information. So if you have a particular legal question, I will tell you how to get in touch with Legal Aid of North Carolina, but I cannot give you individually legal advice for your specific situation. And then secondly, this presentation will discuss North Carolina law only. I am only licensed in the state of North Carolina. So if you live in another state, the laws for your state may, it may be different. First of all, what is Legal Aid of North Carolina? Legal Aid of North Carolina is a statewide nonprofit law firm providing free legal services and civil matters to low income people in order to ensure equal access to justice and to remove legal barriers to economic opportunity. Here is a list of common cases we handle. We help people obtain domestic violence protective orders to protect survivors of family violence. We help tenants fight evictions. We fight the illegal termination of public benefits such as food stamps and Medicaid. We assist homeowners who are going through foreclosure and we help people who are facing illegal or unfair debt collection. This screen is important if you are trying to get in touch with us to reach our helpline for any age of client. Our number is 1-866-219-5262. That's 1-866-219-5262. If you are a senior citizen living in North Carolina, and by senior citizen, that is defined as age 60 and over, we have a special senior law project with its own separate intake line. And that number is 7562. We also uh, accept online applicants. Well, uh, the online applications may be suspended temporarily, but you can check our website, which is www.legalaidnc.org. So common end of life planning documents that we, we help clients prepare and these are also called estate planning documents. So the big four documents are, first of all, a will. Most everyone has heard of wills. Another document that is important for estate planning is the financial power of attorney, typically referred to as a power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, and a living will. Why should I have end of life planning documents? Well, these documents are helpful to you and your loved, one, loved ones if you become sick or incapacitated. They can help make sure things happen the way you want them to happen at the end of your life 
and after you pass away. And they can be especially important if your biological relatives are not the people you want assisting you in an emergency or inheriting your property after you pass. What is a will? A will is a legal document that sets out who will inherit your assets after you pass away and who is to manage the property until it is passed on to your heirs. It says who gets your stuff, your real estate, your car, your money, and your per items of personal property after you die. And a will also sets out who handles the paperwork to make sure that those people do indeed get the stuff that you left them. When does a will take effect? A will takes effect upon your death. A will has no effect and no meaning until the day you pass away. You could change your will every day of your life if you wanted to, as long as you still have testamentary capacity, meaning that you are still mentally competent to make a will. If you did, in fact, make more than one will, the only will that would be followed is the last one that you executed before you pass away, assuming that you did in fact have testamentary capacity when you made the will. So what happens if you die without a will? If you die without a will, your property does not go to the state. You will often hear people say that they do not want their property to go to the state and thus they want a will. But if you do not have a will and you die, your assets pass by North Carolina laws called the laws of intestate succession or the laws of intestacy. Essentially, your assets go to your closest family members through legally recognized relationships. So exactly who gets your property depends on a lot of factors like the makeup of your family, and how your assets are titled. So if you uh, need advice on what would happen if you died without a will, then you should speak with an attorney about your specific situation. So what the question of what happens if you die without a will makes creates a lot of confusion for some people because they get that question mixed up with what happens if you owe money to Medicaid for long-term care. Because Medicaid, everyone has heard that Medicaid sometimes goes after your property after you pass away. But that has nothing to do with whether you have a will or not. Medicaid estate planning is very complex. And if you have questions about Medicaid estate planning, you should speak with an attorney about your complex situation and, and they can discuss all the factors with you that would need to be discussed. Wills and minor children or disabled adults. In your will, you can nominate someone to become the guardian of your minor children or of a disabled adult over whom you have guardianship. This is not binding on any court, but it would probably be persuasive to a judge. Standby guardianship is when someone is when you set up someone in advance to be guardian over a minor child or disabled adult. This is done through a petition in front of the clerk and it cannot be done through a will. And it requires that the parent or guardian have a fatal or progressive chronic illness. What is a financial power of attorney? When people just use the term power of attorney, usually they mean the one for financial affairs. A financial power of attorney is a document that names someone to help you out in financial matters. The person who helps you out is called your agent, although people often use the term power of attorney when they're referring to their agent. They say, my power of attorney did this on my behalf, when actually they mean their agent through the power of attorney. 
But an example of when you might want a power, a financial power of attorney is if you had an unexpected accident and went into a coma, your agent could immediately call your mortgage company to make sure your payment had been made for your home. And your agent could write a check to make your payment and save your home. In a financial power of attorney, some examples of things your agent could do for you include that your agent could write checks from your bank account, your agent could transfer money from your savings account to your checking account, your agent could call your car insurance company to cancel your car insurance, your agent could also call the county tax office to ask if your real estate taxes are paid up to date. When does a, a financial power of attorney take effect? In other words, when can your agent start helping you out? You can choose when to have your agent be able to help you. You can choose to have your agent be able to help you right away or only upon some future event, such as if you became incapacitated and could no longer handle your financial affairs yourself. There are limits on what an agent can do. Even though your agent is given access to your finances, North Carolina law says the agent must use your money in a way that benefits you and you only. This is called a fiduciary responsibility. So as an example, your agent may have the authority to write checks from your account, but the agent should not write a check to pay her own cell phone bill. As a warning to our clients, the financial power of attorney in particular creates the potential for financial abuse and exploitation. It gives someone access to your money. Agents are not supposed to use this access to benefit themselves, but this does not mean that that, that never happens. Therefore, in choosing the agent for your financial power of attorney, you want to be very, very careful whom you pick to be your agent. What is the difference between a power of attorney and guardianship? A power of attorney by itself does not take away any of your own decision-making power. Your agent does not get to take over your finances or your life. So as an example, one of my colleagues' fathers had a power of attorney for her because she went to law school in New York City, in New York State. But she still retained authority over her own decision-making power, her finances, and her life. If you are declared legally incompetent and have a guardian appointed, then that requires a court decision. Whereas nominating, uh, signing a power of attorney document, creating an agent for yourself under a financial power of attorney does not require a court decision. We often get the question of how can I get power of attorney over mom? The answer is you can't. Only the principal, only mom herself can execute a power of attorney. An agent or helper cannot execute a power of attorney on behalf of mom. If the principal is unwilling or unable, for example, if the principal is unconscious or incompetent to sign a power of attorney, then there's no way to get one. And the helper in that case must seek guardianship, which does require a court order declaring incompetency. What is a healthcare power of attorney? A healthcare power of attorney document names someone to make your medical and healthcare decisions if you are no longer able to make those decisions for yourself. For example, if you have a car accident and are unconscious, your healthcare agent could decide if you should have surgery right away or wait. What kind of decisions can your healthcare agent make? Examples of some of the decisions your healthcare agent could make are whether to consent to surgery, 
whether to, you should enter a nursing home, whether you should leave a nursing home, whether the, to change the dosage of your medications, whether to request medical records and to sign necessary releases for medical records, and basically any medical decision you could make for yourself unless you specify limits in the healthcare power of attorney. What is the difference between a financial power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney? The financial power of attorney deals with financial matters. And the healthcare power of attorney deals with healthcare and medical matters. Having only one of these documents does not give your agent authority in the other arena. So for example, your agent under the healthcare power of attorney could not close out your bank account for you. And your agent under a financial power of attorney could not change the dosage of your medications. Having temporary technical difficulty, moving to the next screen. When does a healthcare power of attorney take effect? In other words, when does the healthcare, I think we already went over that. Okay, the next slide says, what is a living will? A living will is a document that tells your doctors that if you are nearing the end of your life, you do not want certain extraordinary life prolonging measures. For example, your living will might say, if I'm expected to die very soon, I do not want to be put on a ventilator. A living will is also called an advanced directive for a natural death. What's the difference between a healthcare power of attorney and a living will? A healthcare power of attorney names someone else to make your medical decisions if you can't make them yourself. A living will expresses your own wishes for your end of life care. There is often some overlap, but it's not perfect overlap. For example, someone might live with dementia for years and need a healthcare power of attorney agent to make everyday healthcare decisions, but not necessarily be at the end of his or her life yet. What's the difference between a living will and a DNR? A DNR or do not resuscitate order is a medical order, which must come from a doctor. A living will is a legal document that you execute yourself probably with the help of a lawyer. A lawyer cannot give you a DNR order. Only a doctor can do that. When does a living will take effect? You can choose the specific triggers in your own living will document, but generally it is when you are very sick and or not expected to live for very long. What is needed for these documents to be valid? In order for these documents to be valid and enforceable, these documents must be executed in a formal way. Lawyers use the term executed to mean signed by the maker, that is you and others in a way that is set out by statute. For example, if you email your neighbor and say, I want you to get everything. This statement, this email would not be enforced by the courts. This would not transfer title to your assets to the neighbor when you passed away. Another example is grandpa drives granddaughter around the farm and says, this will all be yours someday. That's not a valid will and does not transfer ownership to the granddaughter at the time of the grandfather's death. What are the requirements for valid execution? In general, there are three requirements. It must be signed by the principal, that is the maker, you. It must also be signed by two witnesses who must be disinterested as that is defined by law. Generally, a disinterested witness is one who does not have 
a particular personal interest in the outcome of those documents. It must be acknowledged by a notary, except the exception to these requirements for the documents I have discussed is that the financial power of attorney does not require two witnesses. The financial power of attorney only needs to be signed by the principal and notarized. Prior to May 4th, 2020, these requirements meant that four people had to be in the room together the principal, the maker of the documents, witness one, witness two, and a notary. So as you can imagine, due to COVID-19, a few new laws re regarding notarization and witnessing of documents went into effect. And the most recent change, if you will, to, these, to this series of changes is that on July 8th, 2022, Governor Cooper signed into law a bill that would permanently allow certain documents to be notarized electronically in North Carolina beginning July 1st, 2023. Session Law 2022-54 lays the groundwork and establishes the procedures for future remote online notarization in North Carolina. Notaries physically located in North Carolina will be allowed to notarize certain documents so long as the notary is able to adequately verify that the principal is located in the United States, U.S. territories, U.S. embassies, or on a U.S. military base. The Secretary of State's office is direct, has been directed by this new law to begin rulemaking for its implementation which will ultimately go into effect July 1st, 2023. But in the meantime, this bill signed into law on July 8th provided that emergency video notarizations provisions enacted during COVID would resume immediately as a stopgap measure to allow video notarizations while the permanent note procedures are being put into, uh, into effect. So the emergency video notarization expires on June 30th, 2023, when the permanent procedures take effect. The North Carolina statutes governing both notaries and the execution of wills used to require that these four people be literally physically near to one another. The notarial act required close physical proximity. So this, of course, became a problem with social distancing practices during COVID. So the new law states that notaries may notarize documents by video conference technology, applications like Zoom or Skype. There are some requirements. Both the principal and the notary must be in North Carolina, but they don't have to be together or in close physical proximity. They must be able to see and hear one another clearly and must be able to interact in real time with one another. And the notary must watch the principal sign using the video technology. Like notarizing, these new laws also allow witnessing by video conference technology. The requirements are very similar to video notarizing. The witness must be in North Carolina. The technology has to allow for real-time interaction. The witness and the principal must be able to hear and see each other clearly. Witnesses can each sign a different version or counterpart of the document, which can then be combined later to create one original document. If you don't have access to video conferencing, if you and the notary and the witnesses all feel comfortable, you can try to execute these documents the regular way in person and observe social distancing. So some examples of what legal aid has been doing through the pandemic are we've had all parties in the same room, but six feet apart. We've separated people by tables or plexiglass. We've had signers remain in their car outside the office and documents have been passed through the windows. We've had all parties wear PPE, such as masks and gloves. 
And we have also donated a lot of pins during this time as we have attempted to not allow the sharing of pins. So I am sorry that I skipped ahead on the last slide, but Legal Aid has worked creatively to come up with how to help our clients through this pandemic. In many areas, we've had drive-through wills clinics during which clients stay in their cars to sign documents and the witnesses watch the client sign through the window. Some senior centers have been closed and are still facing waves of COVID where they have been closed on a temporary basis only to reopen again as soon as everyone is well. So this has posed a problem or a challenge is this is where we normally execute these documents with clients. Handwritten wills are also called holographic wills. This is an option you have if you cannot get to an attorney to prepare a will for you right away. But this should be a temporary stopgap solution. We advise all of our clients to go to an attorney to have a will prepared as soon as it is feasible to do so. There are a lot of requirements for a valid handwritten will and the specificity of these requirements makes them easily challenged. They must be written entirely in the handwriting of the testator, that is the person making the will. They must be signed by the testator. They must be found in a proper place, such as a safety deposit box or the testator's important papers or with someone else for safekeeping. After death, three witnesses must testify to the handwriting of the testator, the person making the will. And one witness must testify that the document was found with the important papers of the testator. As you can see, all of these requirements, plus the question of whether this person even had testamentary capacity, leave these wills subject to a lot of reasons for challenge. And that is why we tell our clients that they should only be a temporary stopgap procedure. And that our clients, we advise our clients very strongly to come make a, a will as soon as possible. So there are tips though for writing a handwritten will. Um, our number one tip is to keep it simple, distribute property clearly with no conditions, such as to all my children in equal shares, not to my son, but only if he has graduated high school and had children. Um, so we don't advise people to go into all those specific restrictions with a holographic or handwritten will. We also advise them to identify their property clearly in a way that even a stranger would understand. For example, they should list a, their home place as 136 Oak Street, Asheville, North Carolina, not the old home place or the mountain house. How do you go about applying for legal aid services? Our helpline is open to people of all ages and may be reached by dialing 1-866-219-5262. And our senior helpline for people age 60 and over can be reached by dialing 1-877-579-7529. We also have a website at www.legalaidnc.org, but at different times, our online application process has been suspended due to an overwhelming demand. So I would suggest that the best way to, to reach us is by telephone at one of those numbers on this screen. So thank you for participating today. And if there are any, um, any general questions, I'll try to answer those.
I'm not seeing anything in Q&A or chat. Let's check Facebook. No comments on Facebook. I think we can just end. Okay, thank you. Thank you for participating. Yeah. Um, sorry, just looking at something. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you uh, again to uh, our presenter, Kim Eggers. Um, that was great. Um, and thank you to everyone that participated. I'll end it.